Θέλω να εκφράσω ε, ακόμα μια φορά την ε, βαθύτατη ευχαρίστηση που έχουμε να φιλοξενούμε σήμερα εδώ τον ε, νομπελίστα οικονομολόγο Τόμας Σάρτζεντ. I just wanted to repeat once more. Professor Sargent, I just wanted to repeat once more what a great honor it is for everyone involved in this conference to have you in Greece and at the Emergency Economic Summit. And as we are wrapping up uh, for the last panel of the day, I would like to remind you that uh, in about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, we expect the Greek Finance Minister to address this audience. Uh, we're all very interested uh, to hear what he has to say. And we're looking forward both to uh, the panel, which is a very interesting topic, a topic that has troubled Greece for many decades, dealing with uh, eradicating cronyism and corruption. Um, and then we'll move forward with uh, the last keynote speech by uh, Minister Varoufakis. And then for the closing remarks, we will have the honor to uh, listen again from uh, our very distinguished guest, Professor Thomas Sargent. So, with no further ado, I would like to invite on the floor the moderator for this panel, Pascos Mandravelis, uh, a very important journalist uh, from Kathimerini, who through his op-eds over the past decades has been promoting economic reform uh, in his own unique way. So please invite, uh, welcome Pascos Mandravelis. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me in this wonderful conference. There's a lot of things that, uh, as a journalist, I didn't know, and I was amazed by the speech that the steps that Russia took towards uh, its uh, bankruptcy. And uh, it's something that we should think about it. And uh, now we are moving to the next session, which has, which has a, a very ambitious title, Eradicating Cronyism and Corruption. Well, eradicating, actually, it's, it's hopeful, but it's utopian. Because if we think that uh, in the most holy company of the history, one of the 12 uh, pupils of uh, Jesus Christ was corrupted, well, we cannot expect much in, uh, you know, in a government or in, uh, uh, in uh, other social forms. So I want to, to invite Mr. Aristides Kajis, who is... Uh, Mr. Simeon Zankov, Mr. Otto Bronz Peterson, I don't know if my spelling was correct, and Panagiotis Evangelopoulos to the panel. Aristides Kazis, besides a good friend, he's a professor at the University of, uh, uh, of Athens. And he received his doctorate from, uh, on the economics of contract law under the supervision of Richard Posner. And uh, he's one of the first liberals who actually went to the Greek university. And the floor is yours. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Atlas Network and Cato Institute. These are beacons of liberty for us in Greece. All the other partners and colleagues in Greece, uh, Friedrich Naumann, Kefim, everyone, for this invitation. Eradication is a very strong word. Eradicating corruption and cronyism is not an easy thing. Both phenomena are connected to the institutional framework and to the historical circumstances, but also to culture. Greece, 
the supposedly Hetu. Okay, now that's the title. <laughs> uh, Greece is a Balkan country with an Ottoman Middle East past. It's also a country where entitlement, uh, enlightenment, modernization, and liberal democracy were half baked. It is extremely difficult to uproot corruption and cronyism, where the root causes are cultural and so deeply embedded in the, let's say, national character. It takes so much time when time is of essence here. Fortunately, there is a way to overcome the status quo, the cultural embedments, and there is a way that has rather impressive results in a relatively short time. Economic freedom is not only beneficial in reducing corruption, it's instrumental. As you can see in this graph, the inverse, uh, sorry, this inverse relationship is quite robust. This negative correlation is more obvious in this graph. More free markets, less corruption. Less free markets, more corruption. It's rather obvious. Let's put this, I, I know I understand that this is not uh, so simple as it sounds, of course, it isn't simple, but let this put into a test. Which do you think is the least free economy in the European Union? can hear you. Okay, that is correct. Greece is considered a mostly unfree economy by all the indices of economic freedom. This is a market that cannot be characterized as free under any methodology. And this is our neighborhood. As you can see, Greece is not the typical European country, at least in terms of economic freedom. However, the lack of economic freedom is not only instrumental for the high levels of economic corruption, but also for political corruption, that is, cronyism. One could characterize Greece as a textbook example of chronic capitalism because Greece is organized as a corporatist, clientelist state. It's the paradise of oligopolies, of closed professions, and strong public sector unions. The political system is self-serving. It is interwined with economic oligarchy and protective of every medium and small size vested interest imaginable, with a thick web of over-regulation from oil refineries and banks to the publishing industry and dairy product markets, taxi drivers and lawyers, and even the cleaning ladies. But not all the cleaning ladies, not only those cleaning ladies working for the ministries. This corporate state is supported by an institutional framework that can be characterized as extractive. According to Azemoglu and Robinson, extractive economic institutions are the exact opposite of the inclusive institutions. They are designed by the politically powerful elites to extract resources from the rest of society and redistribute them. As we can see, the system of extractive institutions is not static, but developing. Please notice the long-term... Um, sorry, the impulse to press a button is very strong. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, please notice the long-term score change in uh, the rule of law uh, index, especially uh, the de 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 deterioration of uh, pri uh, private property uh, rights protection for the past two decades or so. 
I don't think that there is a better example for the way these extractive institutions are working than the discriminatory way the Greek political system treats workers from the public and the private sector during the crisis. The few layoffs at the public sector became a major political issue. And one of the very first decisions of the new government was to reinstate them in their uh, jobs, even though most of them didn't lose exactly their job, but they entered a mobility scheme where they were paid something like 75% of their wages until they transferred uh, to another position. At the same time, almost 1.5 million people lost their jobs in the private sector and, the, and more than 90% of them do not currently receive any kind of unemployment benefits. The prospects to find a job uh, with this state of the economy and with an economy which is mostly unfree is minimal, if non-existent. The second example is welfare populism. Please look at this very interesting uh, graph about the rising share of GDP to social benefits over the past decade, the past decade before uh, the crisis. What do you notice? First of all, as you can see, Portugal, Ireland, Spain is the sober one, uh, Italy, Greece is always the champion. You can see why Germans have the money. Γιατί μας δανείζουν οι Γερμανοί. Νομίζω ότι μπορείτε να το δείτε πολύ καλά. This was, I'm sorry for my Greek. This was an inside joke. Uh, see this huge difference. In the case of Greece, this increase led to this paradox, or rather a tragedy. Greece had an embarrassingly low and it still has an embarrassingly low employment rate. Government spent nearly half of its budget on social benefits, however, with a huge deficit per person before the crisis. If we look very closely at these numbers, we have to admit that, after all, this was a very generous state. It was almost an, a social state. So, one, I mean, with giving so much social benefits, one could expect that this kind of social policies would have eradicated poverty altogether. But, of course, this was not the case. It never is. The indicator of the efficiency of social benefits in alleviating poverty in Greece was before the crisis the worst in the European Union, only 13%, where the European average was 35%, and some Scandinavian countries were so efficient as so much efficient as reaching uh, the early uh, or late 70s. Um, and in 2002, this indicator for Greece was a mere 4%. What does this mean? That even though there is a wide redistribution, this is not a redistribution in favor of the economically weak. Look at this graph. This graph is disgraceful for Greece. It's not only it's disgraceful not only for Greece but for, for other countries, as you can see, but for Greece in particular. As late as 2011, the highest quantile to 20%. The highest quantile in Greece received more than three times in social benefits than the lowest quantile. I'm going to repeat this in Greek because it's very important. To 20% των πλουσίων Ελλήνων ελάμβανε από το κράτος σε κοινωνικές παροχές πάνω από τρεις φορές αυτό που ελάμβανε το χαμηλότερο 20%. To put it simply, the Greek welfare state, the Greek welfare populism, were covers a disguise for a huge redistribution scheme for the benefit of the economically and politically powerful. Who got this money? The cronies. These uh, benefits 
were the award for rent seeking. As a result, Greece became a low level of trust kind of a society. Greeks do not trust the government, do not trust, they do not trust their institutions, they do not trust each other, and they don't seem to care about one another. It's a kind of a Hobbesian jungle to live in Greece. The numbers uh, before and after the crisis were ide are identical. There are no uh, uh, many differences. So this is an economy which is not free, a society with high levels of corruption, a political system permeated by cronies with extractive institutions whose basic function is to redistribute money from loans and subsidies to the politically and economically powerful. Is the system sustainable? Of course it isn't. It is a system which urgently needs an institutional makeover. It is a system that urgently needs a radical pro-market structural reforms. Is free market a panacea? Of course not. But it's a great medicine for a lot of things, including the rule of law. Look at this at the following graphs. Free market is beneficial for political rights and democracy. Free markets are also beneficial for individual and civil rights. Free markets are even beneficial for social rights. And free markets are even good about economic inequality. However, Greece has now a government that was elected with a mandate of statism. Most of the people in this government believe that they still live in the early 70s. They didn't realize what happened in 1989, probably because they were very busy becoming members of the Communist Party. And they cannot understand how the global economy really works. They are Luddites, Luddites. Αυτοί που έσπασαν τα μηχανήματα, I'm explaining what Luddites mean. Uh, στην Αγγλία ε, έσπασαν τα μηχανήματα επειδή έφαναν τις θέσεις εργασίες τους. They are not only Luddites, they have an authoritarian mind. And this is obvious from their very first decisions and behavior. In almost everything from the economy to the higher education. I know it's funny, but at the same time it's completely scary, but this government really believes that Greece is a neoliberal hell. <laughs> it is certainly a hell, but not a liberal one. Greece cannot be saved by any other crony capitalist governments. Greece cannot be saved by a miracle or by a divine intervention. Greece can only be saved by the market, the free, open, efficiently regulated, competitive market. Any other alternative is non-existent or just metaphysical. Thank you very much. If you like this... If you like this presentation and you want to, to see the numbers more closely or you just want the cartoons, you can send me an email and I can send you the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Aristides. Now, the, the fact that the highest quantile gets uh, th three times more than the lowest quantile, we can see why it, it is so much support against reforms here in Greece. And I would expect from the left government to be pro-reformist instead and a right-wing government to be against reforms. But things are happening the opposite way here in Greece. Now, our next speaker is Danis. I know an ex-Prime Minister who would love to hear him, uh, George Papandreou, who said that we should become Denmark of the, of the South. And uh, it's Otto, Otto Bronze Petersen, and he is Director for Analysis for the Danish Center for Political Studies. He was previously worked with uh, economic policy in the civil service in a number of positions, among others, as Deputy Permanent Secretary on Economics. That's something that is a lot discussed here in Greece, but we never do it. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you at, uh, at this uh, 
very critical time, I, I guess, in, in... Thank you very much. Um, I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about the promise of reform. Um, there's no doubt that... that could I get this slide? There's no doubt that uh, the situation that you are in with a very difficult economic uh, situation is, is, is posing a lot of difficult challenges. But it's also uh, uh, giving you an opportunity uh, for reform. And it, it could, and there are examples, um, that you, if, if you implement, uh, use the opportunity for radical reform, you could come out stronger on the other side. Um, this has been the case for a number of countries which have been mentioned here today. Um, Sweden was one example, Finland is another example, which had very severe crisis in the 1990s. Denmark had a very severe crisis in the early 80s, and I thought I would just uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, the situation was that the government deficit was growing very rapidly. We had a spell of inflation and rapid uh, or continuous devaluations. So the government decided, the new government decided that they had to introduce uh, fiscal authority, uh, austerity, um, over the next uh, four or five years to the tune of 10% uh, of GDP. And they also decided that uh, uh, to fix the exchange rate and to try to, to break the uh, inflation expectations. Well, everybody expected that such a policy might it would work in the long run, but in the short run it would uh, have a, a, a negative effect on growth and the economy. I would like to share a slide with you if I could. It's, it's not here. Well, let me, let me tell, me, tell you what happened. Much to the surprise to um, both the Danish government and everyone else, the, the Danish economy went into uh, an upswing. And it carried a strong upswing for the period of fiscal uh, uh, contraction. So this episode is uh, seen as one of the most uh, clear examples of what was later to be called expansionary fiscal contraction. And it shows that when you implement reform, some of the benefits will carry forward, uh, some of the long-run benefits will carry forward into the short run via expectations. So what we, what we had in Denmark was uh, increasing uh, investments and increasing private consumption because of uh, the, the, the positive effect on expectations. Now you can't expect any spell of, uh, of, of fiscal authority to, uh, to, uh, uh, to have an expansive effect. Uh, that's not guaranteed. But it does show that when you are committed to a reform, you have, the, you have an, a, a, an opportunity, a, a surplus, which, uh, which gives a promise to, uh, to the people uh, and to, to the future of the country, which is very important to, to recognize. This is, I think, is also true when you look at uh, corruption and cronyism and other kinds of rent seeking, which it really is. Because what is uh, rent seeking? Well, basically, rent seeking is not a, a zero sum game, it's a negative sum game. Uh, and it means there is a cost to, to society. Um, when you are able, through radical reform, to uh, reduce the level of rent seeking. There is a surplus which can compensate some of those who uh, might lose from it in, in, the, uh, in, in the short run. Uh, and I have, nobody knows how much rent seeking we have. I tried to look into, into, the, into the numbers. Um, and 
they appear staggering. They appear staggering. Um, There you go. Uh, there is a, there's a study, which was the only one I could find, estimating the, the loss from rent seeking to the to the Greece, uh, Greek economy. And it, uh, this is of course very uncertain, but it says that the social cost of rent seeking is as much as half of the government revenue as much as a half revenue, which means that in the theoretical case where you could get rid, get rid of rent-seeking, you could uh, sort of double the value of, of, your, of your government revenue. This is really a lot. This is really a lot, and it does underscore the importance to do something about rent-seeking, and I guess in in this country, um, where cronyism and corruption is a problem, uh, much more than it is in, in, in my country, we have all kinds of rent seeking. But in, in this country, it carries uh, a, a huge promise, and I, guess, I think that the opportunity you, you now have for major reform, it could be interesting to use that to, uh, to have a process of reversed. Uh, rent seeking of uh, reversed lock rolling and using that surplus, that, re re that uh, social surplus you really have uh, as uh, a way of uh, uh, making the Greek economy much stronger than it is. Thank you. Uh, I skip Mr. Simeon Zankov. 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 He's ex Bulgarian prime, uh, deputy prime minister and, uh, and minister of finance. And uh, I believe that his speech, will, his speech will have much interest here in Greece because, as all the world says, that we won't become Greece. In Greece, it's a fear that we might become Bulgarian in terms of wages and corruption. But the point is that if we don't do the reforms, there will be a time that we will hope to become Bulgarian, and we, won't, we cannot do it. So, the floor is yours. Indeed, thank you very much. Um, I took seriously the um, task of talking about reducing corruption some uh, lessons from Bulgaria actually, um, and also the fact that we're in an emergency summit, so mostly it will be useful to talk about things that can uh, happen relatively quickly. Um, so I put together a list of uh, six ways to reduce corruption, which uh, we try to do in, uh, in Bulgaria. Some of them we succeeded, I'll tell you quickly, some of them we didn't succeed, but I still think uh, they're a useful way to think of reducing corruption. So six. Um, number one, the most important, uh, corruption is uh, reduced uh, most uh, significantly if you simply reduce the redistributive role of the state. So in other words, if the state has less money to give out uh, in terms of various services, in terms of uh, various uh, public projects, then almost by definition corruption would be, uh, would be smaller. So in other words, reducing the role of the state in the economy is the easiest, surest, longer term uh, way to reduce uh, corruption. The, what do I mean by that? In the last decade or so, the redistributive power of the Greek government has been roughly half of overall economic activity. So if you look at uh, public uh, sector finances and how much is redistributed by the Greek state as a share of GDP, it has uh, been a bit more than 50% uh, uh, around just before and around the crisis. Now it has fallen somewhat to about 47% forecasted this, uh, this year. Um, to give you the example from Bulgaria, it uh, gravitates around 33-34% a year. In other words, Bulgaria spends about 15 percentage points less in government deciding where to use its, uh, its uh, money every year relative to uh, Greece. That automatically reduces uh, the possibilities for corruption. 
Now you can say this is a measure that sounds fine, but it takes a long and painful process to uh, reduce public uh, expenditure to GDP. Not so. Some of the previous speakers have uh, mentioned some examples like Latvia, where in a span of about two years, uh, public uh, expenditure to GDP was reduced by 10, 12, uh, maybe even 15 percent. Slovakia, early on in the reform period, significantly reduced uh, public spending. Uh, Hungary under Minister Bokros. So there are quite a number of examples from Eastern Europe how you can, in a period of two, three years, significantly reduce uh, public spending. The current Greek government doesn't seem to be excited to reduce public spending though, so that's why I'll quickly go through five other uh, measures that are easy to implement, uh, can happen almost uh, overnight, and do not involve uh, any significant uh, expenditures. Uh, my second uh, point then is simply to establish a centralized register of all public, uh, um, public contracts, both at the national level as well as at the municipal level, as well as, well as uh, contracts that are given by um, state-owned enterprises. To make all of this public, not just the tenders, which many of them are public, but also who wins the particular tender and under what conditions, what do they promise to um, deliver and for what uh, costs. Uh, we tried to do this in Bulgaria in 2010, didn't fully succeed, so we have a transparent process for public tenders and some contracts, not all, but once we started putting up contracts, you suddenly start finding what are the small ways in which corruption seeps through. So an example, in uh, infrastructure projects we noticed that uh, some, uh, uh, some companies were winning infrastructure projects by promising that they will maintain the particular road or um, or bridge for 200 years or 300 years, so they were giving guarantees for 200 years into the future that this road, they will maintain it, uh, and winning because of that, which clearly is not uh, reasonable by any, uh, any uh, stretch of um, imagination. So having this transparency of, uh, of uh, centralized register of public uh, procurement helps in itself. It costs almost nothing, just a simple electronic system to produce. The third point is even simpler. For high government officials, not just in the government, but also in parliament, so senior politicians, to have a transparent daily record of who they meet. So just the meetings, the names of the people who they, uh, uh, who they uh, meet. Now that sounds like a silly exercise. Why would we want to know that? Well, because corruption most of the time uh, happens by somebody coming and uh, offering you something and you accepting it. Um, now we had a long discussion at the beginning of our government uh, in Bulgaria how exactly to implement such a, um, such a system. In, in the end it failed in parliament, so it wasn't uh, adopted in parliament. And then if through this lens you look at the subsequent political scandals, many of them have this feature that somebody met some, somebody else in the private uh, uh, sector they were not supposed to meet. Uh, and usually they claim that they have never met. Um, and it turns out that some money exchanged uh, hand. The latest scandal from about uh, two weeks ago or so is, um, you may be aware that one of our largest uh, Bulgarian-owned uh, commercial banks failed last year. And uh, regulators were saying, we've never met uh, the owners of this bank. We don't know them. We've treated them very efficiently. Well, some good investigative journalists uh, found a record in the commercial bank itself who visited the CEO and main owner. Turns out our main regulator was visiting him twice a month, very regularly twice a month. You can wonder why the regularity was and whether it was related to some money exchanging hands. But what was claimed by the regulator clearly was untrue. There was a record, but it was not a public record. Making it public and making it official would help a lot, both for politicians, but also for the private sector to think twice before they order offer uh, bribes. 
Number four, annual audits of municipalities and state-owned companies. In uh, our region, there is still a fairly large share of state-owned uh, companies, more so in Greece than in Bulgaria, I should add, as a share of uh, the economy. And while we haven't talked much about municipalities, a lot of corruption happens at the municipal level, where somehow the uh, transparency happens to be a lot less, and where typically political competition is less. So you often see mayors, city mayors, who've been around for many, many years, at least in the case of Bulgaria. Having some centralized audit, which we did manage to do in um, uh, Bulgaria, has been running now for about five years, suddenly uncovers irregularities of, for example, the mayor's wife running most of uh, the public procurement and winning most of the contracts that, uh, you know, strikes you as uh, somewhat uh, improper. And quickly, the last two points uh, that have been tried around the world. Number five, having an official cooling off period period for politicians in taking either private positions in the private sector, which many countries have, but also regulatory positions, which very few countries have. So in our uh, region it often happens that the so-called independent regulators actually selected among the politicians, among political parties, immediately go from parliament, let's say, to the central bank or the Securities and Exchange Commission or um, the Commission for Protection of Consumers. Not surprisingly, they very well know the rest of the political uh, spectrum and uh, bribing and the possibility for corruption is almost immediate. Many examples in Bulgaria, including uh, now. And the last point that I would like to uh, finish with um, is something that every country has to some extent, but apparently not, uh, not sufficiently, and certainly not in Greece, um, which is having asset and income disclosure of politicians, but not just them, but also their families. I remember when I became finance minister of uh, Bulgaria soon after there were elections here and the first finance minister of uh, Greece at the time, um, we talked quite often about how to deal with the crisis. A couple of years after that, the so-called Lagarde uh, um, uh, memoirs, or however it was called, list came about and it turned out that um, well, it certainly looked like there were a lot of improprieties uh, in the way that uh, family members of the particular minister had uh, dealt with uh, had dealt with money. Uh, in many countries, including in Bulgaria, we increase the requirements for uh, asset and income disclosure, so not just the politician, but also his immediate family is uh, involved in uh, that. Of course, you can avoid that as well by giving it to people not directly uh, related to you. Bulgarian politicians, just like Greek politicians, are very inventive in that uh, way, but still it gives you yet another degree of uh, protecting from uh, possible uh, corruption uh, practices, not enough, but uh, as um, the leader of this session mentioned, perhaps if we can first reduce corruption, then next year when we meet again we can talk about eradicating it. Thank you. There is not much time because Mr. Valfakis probably will be in his, uh, at uh, uh, 515. So, Mr. Panagios Vagalopoulos is assistant professor at the University of Peloponnese, and uh, he will have his uh, speech. I don't know if we will have time for discussion, but sorry for that. If Mr. Valfakis comes, he has a lot of things to do, so he will have his speech immediately. On the contrary, for all the reforms rhetoric that has prevailed in the political arena of Greece against cronism and corruption, which had assumed manichaistic proportions in the way it carried out the tasks of the government in all sectors, the country was eventually led into a serious impasse with incalculable harm being inflicted on the country. The greatest problem for the fight against, against cronism and corruption of the Greek state was its ineffectiveness in reorganizing the Greek society as a whole, reshaping its structures through reconstruction and activation of all the forces with the potential to carry through such a difficult and daring undertaking. 
the institutions of a society are what give it its character and activate it. The Greek state did not dare to embark on significant institutional reforms with the capacity to lead not only to dramatic change, but also to basic improvement in the internal structures, political, social, and economic of our society. Striking examples of this debt end politics are the debt ridden local governments and the debt ridden national health system. Neither before nor after the reforms were municipalities strengthened in no way. No solution was offered to the problem of bureaucracy. Local authorities did not transform themselves into instruments of orderly decentralization. There was no reduction in the cost of central government subsidization and no relief from the suffocating grip of state interventions in the planning of local public works. The new national health system did not succeed in resolving the great paradox that while resources for health were increasing, at the same time, administrative deficits of the participating units were also increasing, as were shortages and lack of necessary resources for carrying out the tasks of health care facilities. What he deserves to mention is that under the shadow of the kingdom of cronism and corruption, as we are accused by many commentators, only the ordinary civil servants, from the doctors to the nurses, are keeping our national health system alive, with very low salaries and more and more work hours practically unpaid by the state. So it arises the famous Greek implicit institution, the famous envelope, that includes the side payment from the patient to the doctor, to the nurse, and so on. In my example, what is the cause of the bribe or of the corruption? Since the side payment from the pension to the doctor happens, that means that the health service in Greece are underpriced by the state for paying the doctors and overpriced by the state for paying the medical provisions in favor of implicit institutional intermediaries, the famous rent seekers of the Greek economy. So, at the lower level, this process shows very explicitly that the black market in Greece restores the function of the pricing system in the economy, while at the higher level it redistributes massively the wealth from the taxpayers to the rent seekers. Moreover, as long as the level of the taxation is never enough for financing the overpriced national health system, the state borrows the money it needs for the huge rewards of the rent seekers, increasing dramatically the public debt at no sustainable level. So, it happens a secondary level of huge redistribution in the Greek economy. The generations of the giant borrowing of the state enjoy the wealth of the generations that they have to repay it. This is so ineffective. So anomalous and so catastrophic procedure was flourishing and actually was being accelerated after the entry of the Greece in the Eurozone, when the Greek state had to pay the lowest interest rates for the public debt in its history. It was like to put oil into the fire, while all we knew that the fire of the Greek public debt was there, and so dangerous as it is again today, because we never heard in our political agora, our invaluable, our invaluable Cassandras, the Greek free market oriented economists, but the statists. The demagogue politicians, both send the right wing and send the left wing, from the new democracy and PASOK, who brought our economy to the total collapse. In this essentially detent situation, whatever the superficial successes achieved, such as fiscal adjustment or a restoration of fiscal balance, or moreover keeping Greece into the Eurozone, or keeping Greece alive, 
putting the insolvency issue aside are actually meaningless because we lost one quarter of our GDP and we achieved the remarkable historically highest record of unemployment of 27%, destroying totally the private sector and the healthier and the more vital cells of our economy. It is obvious that we need a new paradigm of the political economy for application in Greece. The term political economy was emphatically marked by David Ricardo, by this great exponent of classical liberal economic thought, whose objective was to promote enterprise profits through reduction of taxation while at the same time achieving improvement of the wages to labor on the basis of the economic progress of the system. However, long the period of time may seem that separates us from those days, it is no paradox to argue that we once again face the same economic policy dilemmas. It would not be unjust to say, indeed, that the change has been for the worse, not for the better. In generating this global scenario of mountains of state debt to be accumulated by the world's greatest economies, Greece is paradoxically playing a leading role on the front pages of the world's largest and most reputable newspapers as if it is the key protagonist. In reality, of course, it is merely a negligible afterthought, which for all that happens to be the critical weight on the scales, determining the cataclysm of the risk and uncertainty that threat not only the Eurozone, but also the global financial system, which undoubtedly remains institutionally fragile and unstable. If Obama is succumbing to the Greek problem of public debt, he is doing so because he brought the public debt of the United States to the maximum historically level ever, which is only a step away from the most shattering bankruptcy in the economic history of human civilization. Modern Greece, like all the developed big countries in the world, possesses all the characteristics of a deeply rent-seeking society. Greek economic drama is a phenomenal example of the new political economy paradigm according to James Buchanan, Gordon Tallock and Tana Kruger. Politicians work as brokers in a system of political clientelism and patronage. They expand the public sector, exchanging jobs for votes. On the other hand, they push the private sector into bed with the public sector, assigning to the former secure profits, privileges, and finally explicit and legally established rents. On the basis of this trade-off between political and economic rents, farmers are enriched through subsidies and worker unions negotiate collective agreements, fixing wages higher than can be justified on productive grounds. In short, rent-seeking behavior with strong characteristics of cronism and corruption is chronic in modern Greek society, resulting in emergence of a generally inefficient institutional economic framework that is financed through a dramatically expanding public deficit and debt and supported by a strong continental currency, the euro. Uh, sorry, Mr. minutes for my finale. <laughs> In such an economic environment, the only tried and tested way to emerge from it is to follow the approach based on policies of promoting market solutions. In other words, limiting the size of the state and the extent of its intervention, we have to bring it into complete conformity with the requirements of the school of the new political economy. Faced with the impasse of interventionist policies in Greece, the greatest and most welcome surprise in Greece's grey and gloomy political and economic landscape is the application of a comprehensive economic proposal which brings to the fore the most dynamic mix of a well-organized liberalization economic policy upheld by the three pillars of privatizations, deregulations and law taxation. A market solution policy agenda is in itself a necessary and sufficient condition which in conjunction with the timeless conservative traditions, principles and values of the people of Greece, integrity, hard work and ingenuity has the potential to make the greatest contribution to effective handling of the cronism and corruption and the construction of a new mini-state, a private oriented economy and a dynamic community that will turn away our country from lowest common denominator 
leveling of statist ethics and acknowledge the distinction, the leadership and of the intelligent, moral and table who provide the only competent and effective guide for promotion of both the public and the private interest. The new political economy of market approach is the most effective policy against the sterile, ill-fated and in a world unsuccessful politics of the memorandum that left intact the institutional structural problems of the Greek economy that are so strongly connected with chronism and corruption. The memorandum, the Troika and the former government of New Democracy and PASOK failed because they never defended and they never applied market solution policies and they never replaced statist institutions with free institutions. The ostracism of cronism and corruption from the Greek society is the most fundamental reform that we have to undertake for, by the establishment of the ethics of free institutions. This, this is the most efficient way to overcome not only cronism and corruption but also the crisis in Greece. With an economic policy based on free institutions that is comprehensive, sober and well organized so as to provide a framework for development of free, open and unhindered markets, entrepreneurial dynamism, and private initiative within a context of low taxation and minimum state coercion. Okay, thank you. We say repeatedly that Greece is the motherland of democracy, but it is not only this. As the top scholar in law and economics, professor and judge Richard Porson, analyzes in his book The Economics of Justice, Greeks invented the minimal state in Agamemnon era. The invention of the minimal state by Greeks permitted them to establish the most successful historical example of free organization and free association. I argue that this is the recovery road for Greek economy and the most effective way for fighting the Trojan horse of cronism and corruption that undermines our free and democratic ethics. For Mr. Varoufakis, and he could explain us how we could, he could explain us why the negotiations take four months, considering the fact that the world was created in six days. So, okay. Um. Greetings again, everybody. Uh, I am sure that uh, the term emergency and economic summit, uh, the closest thing to an emergency here is to make sure that uh, Finance Minister Varoufakis keeps his schedule. And we're already a few minutes behind, and I would like to apologize for that. However, uh, I want to invite uh, Takis Mikas, who's going to introduce our next keynote speaker. I invite the panelists, if they want, to uh, sit down with the audience so everybody can uh, enjoy and uh, listen to fin the finance the finance minister speak and I want to thank again and I want to invite you to thank again the panelists of eradicating cronyism and corruption. A final note is that after the last keynote speech uh, Professor Sargent, uh, our distinguished guest, has agreed to offer the, the summarizing remarks, the closing remarks of the conference. So after that we will have the chance to see two very distinguished speakers address our audience. Thank you so much. Takis Mikas. On the part of the organizers and the participants of the conference, we would like to thank very much uh, our next speaker, which is the Minister of Finance of Greece, Mr. Varoufakis, for his presence here. Uh, the, the, thing, the, the fact that he found time and energy, given his very tight schedule, to come and attend this conference and be present and share with us his views on various matters. Uh, there are, I would like to make two points that make his presence especially relevant to a conference of uh, free market supporters. The first is that Mr. Varoufakis defines himself, defines his political philosophy as libertarian Marxism. 
Now, if we take from libertarianism the central idea, which is the sanctity of property rights, and if we take from Marxism the central idea, which is the withering away of the state, then we get an excellent combination which most people here would like. The, the, the second point which makes Mr. Varoufakis' presence very relevant to this conference, which is not very well known, is that he is one of the most strongest supporters of the greatest recent libertarian philosopher, Robert Nozick. Mr. Varoufakis has explicitly supported Nozick in his debates over social justice with uh, Rawls and has argued that Nozick's view of procedural justice is much superior to the end state justice systems by Rawls. So, I hope that in his speech, Mr. Varoufakis will find also the time to explain to us how he will translate his libertarian proclivities into concrete policy actions. I would like to invite him. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to speak in English. I wasn't prepared for that, but I don't mind doing it. If this uh, splendid introduction doesn't confuse you, nothing will. <laughs> so allow me to try to uh, create some clarity out of this uh, uh, clash of perspectives, which supposedly I represent. And I shall try to do this by sticking to the issue, which is Greece the negotiations, the Euro crisis, and the various attempts of the last five years to uh, sort out this great mess of ours. I always like to uh, pay my respects to the organizers and to the proclivities of the audience, and I shall try to do this by making sure that I am addressing you as uh, the Atlas Network, the Cato Institute, affiliates, uh, free marketeers, as uh, Takis Michas would say. I shall begin with uh, a sentence from the brochure which introduces this conference. And I quote, the Greek economy cannot continue on its present path, going from bailout to bailout, loan to loan, crisis to crisis. Now is the time for a frank discussion with the Greek public and Greek policymakers about what has to happen to set the country on the path towards fiscal responsibility, economic growth and prosperity. Well, this will be my cue, because it is indeed the case that for the last five years we've been going from bailout to bailout, from loan to loan. I'm constantly being asked, I was asked last night on a television marathon of an interview, only in Greece can you have a three hour interview, <laughs> we believe in quantity not just quality. Um, I was asked why is it that um, when we were first elected and actually during the election campaign I had made it clear that uh, our task is not simply to secure the next loan tranche. Now, as you all know, we haven't secured the, loan, the next loan tranche, and this is why we have such a liquidity crisis in this country. So why is it that we have refused to sign up on the dotted line to secure that loan tranche? Because we believe that the solution is not going from bailout to bailout, from loan to loan, to throwing good borrowed money after bad borrowed money simply in order to keep pretending that a crisis which has to do with insolvency is a crisis of illiquidity, as we have been doing since May 2010. Anyone from the United States of America, which is where these fine institutions like Cato and Atlas originate, anyone who is a free marketeer, I'm not going to mention names or affiliations, but you know who I'm talking about, 
that looked at what has happened over the last five years would have felt a degree of consternation at this comedy of errors, which beginning with the great error of May 2010 of trying to solve out, sort out a major insolvency issue of the Greek state by means of uh, extending to it, to the public sector of Greece, the largest loan in human history on condition of shrinking nominal income by 25 to 30 percent. No one can ever be, begin to believe that that would end well, and it hasn't ended well. They would think that everything that has happened ever since is uh, simply throwing fuel to the fire. And this process, which I happen to agree with, and this is why we have this uh, rather quaint uh, situation where, for instance, let me relate to you a very uh, interesting experience I had in 2011 in New York City. On the same day, I addressed an audience in the New York Federal Reserve in a hedge fund and Occupy Wall Street you realize the depth of the crisis that we find ourselves after 2008, when the same speech, more or less, um, was welcomed by all three audiences with a degree of appreciation. So this kind of confusion, which has been thrown up by the kind of crisis that we've had internationally, at least on the two shores of the Atlantic after 2008, is the issue, and of course Greece being the most fragile part of that uh, bicontinental um, formation, is of course the place where this crisis is felt most acutely. But let me be a bit more precise. What would a free marketeer from the other side of the Atlantic think about the optimal or a sensible way of dealing with this crisis. So I think that he or she would generally be very critical of any idea that the solution to the crisis that began in 2010 in Greece would involve borrowed money, money that is borrowed from uh, taxpayers for the purposes of um, hiding under the carpet a major insolvency. The same person would probably argue that insolvencies can only be solved by means of bankruptcies. Liquidation. Remember 1929? That that harsh attitude towards the insolvent should be Catholic and, you know, as Friedrich von Hayek would say, the only crisis that, uh, the, sorry, there are guesses. the only judgment that matters is uh, the judgment of the marketplace. And it is the marketplace that should determine who goes insolvent and bankrupt and who survives on the basis of a kind of Darwinian process. Maybe some of the Cato Institute, Atlas Network, and so on, um, proponents would argue that not all of them, but some of them would argue that perhaps the banking system needs to be salvaged because banks are not just enterprises, but they offer the payment system, which is uh, the, uh, the vessels and the bloodline of the overall social economy. But nevertheless, they would be absolutely dead against salvaging the boards of directors and the shareholders and the bondholders of those banks. They would also argue that uh, if those banks were to be kept alive, then those who put the money in there in order to keep them alive, the states, should retain not only the right but the obligation of recapitalizing them wrestling control from the board of directors and then very quickly cleansing them and selling them back to the private sector. That is what a free marketeering attitude would uh, expect. This is not what has happened in Europe. It's not what has happened in the Eurozone. It is certainly not what has happened in Greece. So this is perhaps, Taki, one of the reasons why a member of 
a radical left-wing government and you folks can have a common language, at least to some extent. Thank you, by the way, my support for Robert Nozick was only in relation to his uh, uh, debates with John Rawls. I always said that out of the two, I think Nozick was intellectually closer to my way of thinking, uh, with his emphasis on a concept which I can understand and feel more in my bones, the concept of liberty and voluntary transactions. But where I differed with Nozick, and you'll see how this connects with the crisis and the Greek situation in particular, was in his definition of uh, what it means to be free in a social context. And that difference is also possibly our difference regarding what optimal policy is uh, when faced with a great depression like that which the Greek state finds itself in. So let take, let's take this out of uh, uh, the way just very, very briefly by saying that where we would probably agree was that following the entry into the monetary union of Greece in the year 2001 or so, a certain illusion of uh, convergence, especially illusion in the mind of investors, of the private sector banking system, led to a massive capital inflow into this country, not only in this country, in other countries through Ireland, Spain, and so on and so forth. The difference between Ireland and Greece was that this illusion fed the capital flows directly into the developers' coffers, into the private sector, created bubbles in real estate, which then burst, then the developers went bust, then the banks went bust, and then the state inherited the mess. Here, the capital inflow went straight into the state, which then engaged developers to build roads and Olympic uh, sites and so on and so forth. Uh, one way or the other, when the 2008 disaster took place, then also these kinds of bubbles burst, and in our infinite wisdom, we decided to pretend that this whole thing could go away with, by means of more loans, loans that humanity has never seen before, uh, with a so-called reform agenda, which was simply a fig leaf for affecting those loans and pretending that the insolvencies that we were facing following the bursting of the bubbles were cases of illiquidity. And after that, once we got caught up in this uh, balance sheet recession, as Richard Kuh would say about Northern Europe and Great Depression here, a debt deflationary cycle like that that Irving Fisher would uh, uh, know all about and would uh, describe accurately and poignantly. We have been doing what the brochure um, explained as going from bailout to bailout, loan to loan, crisis to crisis. So let me now, once, once, as this preface has uh, been completed, go straight to the question that someone else asked, why is this negotiation taking eons to complete? Well, let me give you a very precise example. The way the institutions have been working since 2010, but they continue to work in this way, is by asking a simple question. What does the debt to GDP ratio of Greece have to be in some point in the future, let's say 2019 or 2022, so that we can imagine that in, at that point in time in the future, it will be low enough for Greece to return to the markets and therefore not to have to re rely on institutional uh, loans, on official loans anymore, or official help anymore. Then, so the, 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 the program that is current at the moment and remains current, which we're trying to negotiate, changes to, states that in 2019 that uh, debt to nominal GDP ratio should be 139%, just a smidgen below 140%. Now it has, it's just over 180%. And then they ask the question, to get there, to have this drop of the debt to GDP ratio by 41%, what do we need? And the answer that they give is, derived as follows. First, they assume a certain growth rate. So they assume that growth is going to be just above 27% just 
in cumulative terms from today to 2019. 27% higher income in 2019 compared to now. And then they work out, that's a very simple calculation, that in order to push, under that assumption of growth, to push down the debt to GDP ratio from 182% to 139%, which is necessary in their estimation to bring us back out into the marketplace, we will need uh, a cumulative primary surplus of around 20%. And then all the whole, the, the, the policy framework as to what we should do about privatization, what we should do about the pension system, the, the whole fiscal plan revolves around those two numbers. The assumption of that we shall have growth of about 27% over the next four years and a primary surplus, surplus of 20%. Now, the problem, of course, is that these two numbers are dynamically inconsistent with one another. That if we try to extract that large surplus of 20% over the last four years from this greatly depressed economy, an economy where the system, the circuits of credit have broken down due to the non-performing loans that are weighing down the, the, the credit system, if we try to extract that, that primary surplus from the economy, from the private sector, we are going to kill the the cow that, that makes the milk. The 27% growth rate that we will need in conjunction with the 20% primary surplus will simply be impossible. And this is what has been happening over the four, last four or five years. This method of what Hayek might describe as central planning, of saying in four or five years this is what the, the debt should be, now let's work backwards what we should do today. This process of backward induction has failed so miserably over the last five years. And this is why I'm standing here. Do you think that uh, a Syriza member of parliament would ever be finance minister? The only reason why I'm standing here in front of you is because the centre-left, centre-right consensus broke down. It failed miserably. It imploded. And it imploded because of the reasons that I just gave. The adoption of a fiscal framework which, with mathematical precision, generated a Great Depression that made Greece unreformable or very difficult to reform. Not that reforms have not been effective, they have. But it's so very difficult to carry a population in the direction of reforms while you have the engineering of a Great Depression. So what do we need to do? Well, what we need to do is, firstly, get rid of this backward induction logic. Ask ourselves the question, what are the primary surpluses that are consistent with a growth rate of the private sector in particular that creates the kind of momentum for the Greek economy to escape, to, to achieve escape velocity from this um, Irvine Fisher-like debt deflationary cycle. Of course, the problem is in our negotiations that when you say this to the other side, to the uh, representatives of the institutions, privately they agree with you. They are learned people. But politically, it's very hard for them to agree to this. Why? Because if they agree, then they will have to confess that the debt to GDP ratio in 2019 will not be just below 140%, but it will be 150%. And that's politically not viable for the constituencies that support the institutions. So truth gets in the way of a debt sustainability analysis, which is then imposed upon Greece with detrimental effects. If you look at the, just do a little compare and contrast over the last five years of the projections by the International Monetary Fund, for instance, of Greek growth and actual growth for the last five years. And look at the projections every year, every year they are renewed. It's a catastrophic record of misprediction. Why? Because of this political constraint not to admit that our debt is unsustainable. So how do we get out of this? Well, a little, a modicum of truth wouldn't matter, would not go amiss. What if we were to admit that an unpayable debt cannot be paid, 
and it has to be restructured. This is something that Wall Street lawyers do every day. City of London lawyers do every day. Frankfurt lawyers do every day. They do this in the private sector. But in the official sector, we have political constraints that stop us from entering this rational debate. And the result is lower growth, lower income, and a lower capacity to repay the loans. So this is the political conundrum we find ourselves in. And I can assure you, standing in front of you, that we were not elected, and I did not accept the position of Minister of Finance in order to perpetuate this misleading of parliaments in many different countries and misleading of the constituencies of the institutions by pretending and extending. Because this is what has been happening over the last few years. So, just to wind up, because I don't want to take too much of your time from your um, splendid conference, we need to have a fiscal plan which is consistent with basic realities, with common sense. And secondly, we need to discuss which reforms are the ones that, in conjunction with a sensible debt sustainability analysis and fiscal plan, will give the Greek economy the boost that it needs. There, we will disagree in precisely the same way that Takis and I might disagree on the definition that Robert Nozick gives to freedom and to voluntary transactions. If you go back to the 19... 20s and 1930s, particularly in the 1920s, and the wonderful debates between John Maynard Keynes and Friedrich von Hayek and von Mises and so on and so forth, you'll get a whiff of the disagreements that we shall have. Maybe the majority in here believe that the, the market knows best, and as long as you cleanse the economy of unsustainable debts, whether these are in the banks or in public organizations, or private companies for that matter, or the state, that as long as you cleanse those bad debts through liquidate, liquidating them, through restructuring them, through writing them down, then um, the market will reboot, the prices will play the role of signaling that uh, Hagek was so uh, enthusiastic about, and then suddenly the economy will grow. That's one side of the story. My side of the story, as you can imagine, is quite different. Um, taking a cue from a variety of uh, economists, not just from Keynes, I believe, and so does my government, that even after you've cleansed an economy of unsustainable debts, an economy can quite readily be caught up in a bad equilibrium where you have a self-sustaining, a kind of uh, uh, the paradox of prophecy, where investors expect aggregate demand to be too low, and therefore, on the basis of that expectation, they invest too little, and lo and behold, they're confirmed by low demand, which confirms their expectations and their actions. And in, especially in a country like Greece, where there is, as I said before, minimal credit due to the NPLs overburdening the banking sector. And at the very same time, you have a dearth of investment as a result of the fear of uh, staking the incomes or falling nominal incomes in the next few years or months or whatever. Uh, what we really need to do, and this is possibly another point of agreement between us, you need to find ways of inspiring confidence in investors to move ahead. You may think that the way to do this is by reducing uh, trade unions' rights, by moving away from uh, any kind of government control. I would say to you that Greece has the most deregulated labor market in the world. It's actually worse than slavery because at least slaves used to have uh, security of shelter and food. In this country, we have 500, 600,000 people who keep working and haven't been paid for five or six months. So, in our estimation, the great question, which may be one that you're not asking, is how can we use public assets in developmental ways through a combination of privatization and by incorporating uh, those remaining public assets that remain in the hands of the, of the public sector within a developmental bank 
that will create the investment flows, which will then uh, crowd in investment from the private sector. This is, of course, an issue of great contention between us. But let me complete this intervention in your conference by saying that occasions like this one, where we can have such great political differences and yet find common ground and a common language by which to discuss on the basis of complete honesty ways of getting out of this vicious cycle, part of, of which of the vicious cycle being these interminable negotiations, because what we are trying to achieve in these negotiations, Taki, is to get the other side to remove itself from a failed logic, which they know to have, it has failed, but which for political reasons they can't acknowledge, while at the same time we acknowledge that Greece, if it doesn't reform itself very seriously, and if it doesn't unleash the creativity of individuals, of groups of individuals, of companies, of movements, because we add social movements to this, Greece is not going to recover whatever macroeconomic miracles we pull out of a hat. Thank you very much. Κυρίε και κύριοι, παρακολουθήσαμε την ομιλία του κυρίου Βαρουφάκη. Ήταν μεγάλη μα τιμή που παρευρέθηκε στο έκτακτο οικονομικό συνέδριο για την Ελλάδα και τον ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την παρουσία του. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a great honor to host the finance minister of Greece in such a very uh, interesting time for our country here. Um, and this pretty much brings us to the point where we can have a very good summary of what we talked today. We heard about Mr. Varoufakis Varoufakis's criticisms to um, our point of view, to the point of view where the free market can be more of a solution rather than a problem, but also uh, we heard about the common language that can help people understand each other and therefore make a, light, a solution more likelier. I would like to invite, and it is a great, great honor to be able to do that today, uh, to the stage, Professor Thomas Sargent, in order to offer the summary of what we heard today. Okay, so... Um... So I guess I'd break this into a, a couple of, first that was, uh, for me that was very interesting um, on a whole bunch of dimensions. Um, actually, I, I, think your, um, I think your finance minister is um, uh, very smart and, um, and after a fashion very uh, thoughtful. He's, he, he was using um, rational expectations exclusively uh, throughout his argument, including a rather sophisticated allusion to the possibility of multiple equilibria uh, of a particular kind, which is one respectable model. Um, I also found that he, um, I'm not only gonna, I'm just gonna say a few things about him because he, uh, I found his talk very stimulating. Um, he, he also didn't uh, complete some sentences that I think are really important that I, that I, that I wanna mention. Um, and he conveyed some rather um, stark inv information to me. Um, first thing is he said, uh, straight out, this is a crisis of insolvency, and, um, and the, uh, the position of his government is that uh, people on the other uh, side better just understand as a starting position, they are not gonna pay um, 
that total amount. It is not a liquidity crisis. It's a more fundamental crisis because they are not going to reform expenditures and taxes enough to let them service that. See, and, they, and, and given that truth, that's the truth that he talked about. Um, listen carefully. The other side is just not negotiating seriously. Uh, because the first thing they're going to have to do is realize they're insolvent and like a bankruptcy, they're going to have to write down. And after they write down, then we start talking. Um, another thing he mentioned several times, and actually if he was talking to my students, I would have to, I would have to make sure they understood what he said. He, several times he mentioned he did not like the backward induction logic. Okay, now, now to say that in Greece, you have to say more. Um, this, is, this is the birthplace of backward induction. So, so what he meant was the particular, he's not against backward induction because he was using it. He was using it when he was declaring that they're, they're insolvent. Um, um, he doesn't like the particular numbers that are made in a particular argument that went into that uh, calculation he showed you. And part of the particular number that he doesn't like is um, his understanding or bet that the Greek state is not going to shrink itself. Um, and the labor markets are not going to be reformed and the pension needs are not going to be reformed. And if you start there, um, there's flaws in the assumptions that you're making about. Because if you don't do these things um, and, you, and you raise taxes a lot, you're not going to grow and you're not going to grow your... So that's what he meant when he said uh, the, the flawed backward induction argument. And there's information about that, about um, um, at least what he thinks is going to happen or should happen um, to, to the Greek political economy. Um, he also said, um, I was taking notes, he said, he talked about the Great Depression which the Greek state finds itself in. He didn't say the Greek economy. Um, <laughs> So I, I would actually love to talk to him because about what he meant about some things. So here's another thing he said. What, so he, his incomplete sentences made it impossible for me to know whether, um, not, not that anyone should care, whether I uh, would go 100% accepting his argument or not. So he talked about, he said the following, and he left out some key words. He said the illusion of convergence led uh, to a capital inflow which went to the state and, and, and fueled the problem that you find yourself in. And um, if, you, if you complete that sentence, uh, many of us will have to agree with it, uh, depending on how you complete it. And it's illusion of convergence, convergence about what? And there, that's where it would be good to talk to them. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and actually point to some things that were in the, the preceding panels. Convergence about what? So um, I've told exactly that story. But so here's the story. So what did people think about the behavior of countries like Italy and Spain and Greece when the euro was set up? What did it mean when the euro was set up? So I'll tell you two stories. This is the illusion of convergence. It is that in order to join the euro, everyone understood that you're going to have to run your fiscal policy and your monetary policy. You weren't going to have a monetary policy. So therefore, you're going to have to run a fiscal policy like Germany or like Finland. You're going to have to balance your budget, obviously, in a present value sense and not live off money printing. And, uh, and the, the moment you signed that, suddenly Greece was going to behave like Germany. Um, just like another G1 and G2, uh, there was another uh, German bailout that actually occurred. Country G1 bailed out G2 massively. West Germany bailed out East Germany for a deal. Uh, you completely drop your social institutions. So if, 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 I think there was an illusion of uh, convergence. I, I agree with them. That the, that the Greek state was not going to behave like that. 
But perhaps there wasn't another illusion. That is that the Germans are going to, the other way is, when we join the Euro, it means the Greeks and the Italians don't have to behave, start behaving like Germans because the Germans are going to behave more like Germans. They like to balance budgets. I let them balance theirs a little more and uh, subsidize other countries. That's a completely different non-convergence. So what was the illusion about? Um, yeah, and anybody who looks at those spreads, sovereign debt spreads, is going to be led to ask questions like this. Um, okay, just one other thing. I, I'm a teacher. The, the Irving Fisher debt deflation, that's irrelevant here. There hasn't been a deflation in Europe. Um, it's not what Fisher was talking about. Um, okay. But, you, but it's easy to agree with many of the things that the finance minister talked about. Um, the, uh, the, uh, that you need a credible sustainability analysis, and that's going to be partly arithmetic. Um, you know, the, the your free market guys, and maybe I'm not, that's a complete sideshow. Um, don't, don't, or, or this, this kind of thing. Um, uh, free market economists from the other side of the Atlantic, we know who they are. Um, my mom taught me if you're going to say something like that, name, have the courage to name the names. But uh, that's my problem. Okay, but there was much, there was much um, valuable in that. Um, and then one, one, one final thing um, that you have to ask. And if he had gone to the pre previous two panels, he would ask this himself. That's a shame. Um, he said, the market knows best. Okay. You've got to complete this. About what? What does it have to know about? And, and uh, one thing the market's trying to figure out, those guys who are negotiating, is what future fiscal policy is going to be in Greece. And... Um, How's the market going to figure that out? Because um, that's a bet about um, all the things that were talked about in this. In this, it's uh, so you, economists can't help you with that. You need uh, you need you need you need politicians. And and in a situation where you're in a fiscal crisis, you've injected profound uncertainty into the um, into the um, politics and the economics. And it's, it's, it's bad uncertainty because it doesn't have to be there. You know, the stuff that a free market economy is good for dealing with is, um, is not second-guessing governments. And that's not what you wanted to do, because then they'll start bribing governments. That's not what you want. What it's good for is figuring out what good technologies are, are out there, what have been invented, what should be implemented, what customers want. Um, it's good at that, and those are those are difficult enough things to figure out, um, and that's why I think every sensible economist, regardless of your view on distribution, whether you like rich people or poor people, you want the government not to be creating risks uh, that aren't there out of their nature. And then uh, finally, what what someone um, should ask the finance minister, and that's the job of journalists, who I think, I know there's very good journalists in Greece, I think of journalists as teachers, that's a big thing that you need, um, is, okay, what's your plan B? And what are you going to do if the guys on the other side don't believe it's insolvent? Uh, are you going to listen uh, to what... Um, the advice that we heard about the, uh, the consequences of the, of the uh, Russian default? And have you thought through, think about backward induction, have you thought through all the consequences of that? Are you really sure? Um, you're talking about the 1920s and 30s? Think about that. Because those were, those were consequences of debts that weren't arranged, and, they, and there were political revolutions. And they didn't look like the American Revolution. They were very nasty. Um, so what's your plan B? If the other guys don't think it's an insolvency problem, then they think you can do better. And then, and then the final thing is, what's your vision of the state? What is your vision of society and state? Not just making fun of your guys, but what's yours? And, and uh, talk about um, Hayek and the debate that he had uh, um, with... Um, 
not with canes, but with, uh, with uh, people like Oscar Lange and Leo Hurwitz, who were building mathematical theorems to try to prove that socialism was a good idea. That's the debate. Um, so, and how did that debate go? So anyway, I'd, I would have liked to hear that. Now, in terms of the, in terms of the, um, so this is all unfair because I'm talking and he can't hear me. Um, so, so, uh, so, but I actually, I actually, the reason, the reason I'm talking like this, uh, my mom or my wife would say, you're out of your mind to talk like this. But the reason I'm talking like this is actually I respect him. I think he's actually someone who, um, who actually uh, understands a lot. Because look what he put on the table, all the things. And I love it that he uses rational expectations. Okay. So now, the earlier parts of the conference, I have to say it was a... Um, it was a great privilege to, to be here because um, they were. It was it was quite different from tone, um, and um, and uh, in terms of being um, maybe with one or two exceptions, um, but in terms of uh, in terms of uh, and in science, in terms of scientific, and all I mean by science is show me your numbers. You know, tell me how you things fit together in numbers. So I I took notes all day long, and I got some. I have some really good leads. Tell me what happened when you, um, okay, what I learned about Denmark, and I learned about um, Slovakia, um, where, where, you, um, you, where you did something, and um, um, where you got these drastically different predictions about how things were going to work, and it, it worked one way. Now, now, those are key observations for what's going on right now as examples. I think you should look at historical precedents. Um, with proper respect for the divergencies. So I learned um, many things about that. Um, um, you know, I also learned that, you know, so I started out as a leftist, far left of your finance minister. Um, and I, and I, I'm, still, I'm still in favor of uh, it outrages, it, I'm still uh, in favor of helping uh, the people that really need it, the poor people that can't help themselves. And um, it outrages me with, when my state, my government doesn't do that. Um, but um, I, I, I actually think many of the, that's what I want to say to him, I think many of the problems in economics and many of the things that drove someone like me who was born a leftist, you don't know how far left, because you have met my parents, uh, really far left, who comes to admire the, um, the uh, well, what Adam Smith had. Adam Smith, he hated, Adam Smith hated businessmen more than anybody in this room or anybody who's been in this room in the last few hours. He thought they were crooks. Every time they got together, they tried to, they, he said, they conspired to uh, create monopolies and screw the public. And, and the proper role of uh, the state is to, uh, is to stop that, not foster it, as the British state was doing at the time. But, you know, so, so I've come to admire both the pure theory and beauty of what Adam Smith had, and the sophisticated thing is that the, the way to get good outcomes is to recognize that people are greedy for themselves and their families, but they'll respond to incentives to make society uh, better off. That's beautiful, and it works. And, um, and I saw that running through, uh, it's, to me, it's energizing to see that faith uh, being put to work through um, all the uh, panels that I heard. So thank you for letting me attend this. I would like very briefly just to make sure um, that you get to see uh, the partners that were involved in this conference, especially those who came from Greece, but also uh, from abroad, because it's really important to keep up promoting these ideas and these policy alternatives if we are really interested in winning the battle of ideas in our country. 
and changing policy for the better. So for that reason, I would like to invite Michael Yakovidis from the Liberal Monitor, uh, the Greek Liberal Monitor. I'd like to invite Nikos Karalabus from the Liberty Forum of Greece, the Centro Philelefero Meleton. Ian Vasquez from the Cato Institute. Hans Stein from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Tom Palmer from the Atlas Network. And it's us saluting you for coming here today, and we hope that we will see you in future battles. Thank you very much.